Adept, did you perhaps think I was joking when I told you to memorize the hymns of self-deprecation exactly? Then the Thane's reaction when you mispronounced the saint's name obviously showed you otherwise. Luckily for you, I was able to ease his rage, convincing him that a decapitating strike from his headsman might be a bit of an overreaction. For now, he is going to pray to the Emperor for guidance on a suitable punishment for your sin. As we wait for his revelation, how about I help you take your mind off your future most likely painful retribution? Let me tell you the story of how House Cawdor became known as the House of Faith. Before they became the emperor-loving mad cultists we know today, House Cardo was a loosely affiliated group of scavengers, relic hunters, beggars, and criminals that primarily lived in the depths of Hive Primus. Under the loose leadership of the charismatic Cardo line, one of the many underhive alliances that form and break constantly in those ever-changing depths, an alliance that would have remained utterly unremarkable if not for a stroke of deadly luck. Around the middle of the 39th millennium, an event known as the Great Collapse occurred. A literally earth-shattering moment in Necromundan history, when a massive hive quake caused one of the sub-spies of Hive Primus to collapse, and jut out over the waist like a broken limb. Hundreds of thousands died in that calamity, an immense tragedy that left behind a substantial amount of salvage for anyone quick enough to claim it, and like a tide of rats picking at a corpse. Those opportunists under Cardor command swarmed that arm, picking it clean, and earning enough from the dead to gain the Cardor line and those under it, the title of Clan House. But even with their fancy new title, House Cardor received no respect, for they were seen as underhive trash by every other house, and could gain no political influence whatsoever. Finding no way to make any significant gains in the harsh and competitive environment that was Hive life, a state of affairs that would have inevitably seen House Carter consumed by a larger and more influential house. A fate that was averted with the rise of the Redemption. The origins of the Redemption, the rather extreme interpretation of the Imperial Faith, can be traced to one man, and Cordarius Brain. A man whose origins are a bit muddled. If you were to dive into what's left of the documented histories, you would see evidence that Encor Darius was either a gang who took a round to the head and found religion, or a calm man cast out of the spire and who made up the redemption to fuel his gambling habits. Of course, go to any member of House Cardo with such theories, and you are bound to get burnt to a crisp, so most wisely go by the sanctioned version of his history. Encor Darius was a humble factorum worker, one of the many easily replaceable members of the drudging class that make up a majority of the population of Necromunda. Those who are destined to live and die working in the vast factorums that keep the world running. Despite the mind-numbing and back-breaking labor that was his lot in life, Encor Darius was a diligent and pious soul who despaired at the suffering of his fellow workers and the greed of the noble houses. He talked constantly to those who would listen about how nobles and workers had lost their way, how their ignorance of the imperial truth had led them away from the emperor, talks that sadly fell on deaf ears, until a miracle showed Encor Darius the way. It was while he was performing his usual duties that he accidentally fell into the workings of one of the machines in his assigned factorum, an occurrence so common in the hives that a foreman would have simply added another number to the casualties report seen it was within an acceptable range, and had another replace him on the line. But this time, Encor Darius did not become another mark on the ledger. He was instead saved by a brilliant burst of light. It was in that moment that Encor Darius knew he was chosen to redeem Necromunda's people and guide them back to the Emperor. Enduring countless trials whose numbers and details changed depending on who you talk to, he led his people to the Underhive and created the first cults. Cults that soon spread from Hive Primus to the rest of Necromunda, and was quickly embraced by the hopeless, desperate, and pitiable alike. Despite this spread though, it did not become a force to be reckoned with, until it was embraced by those who fought to manipulate it to their own ends. While the redemption spread throughout Necromunda, the nobles of House Cawdor were struggling, 
Building your empire on salvage was a risky and dangerous endeavor, and it didn't help that other houses still disrespected them. Their constant conflicts with House Orlock over the difference between salvaging and mining being a prime example. Not to mention the fact that the title of Clan House did nothing to guarantee the loyalty of those unscrupulous peoples that helped form the original clan. They needed a way to not only strengthen their hold in the Hive, but also over their own people. Aeronath VI, the Lord of the House at the time, saw the means to accomplish this when he saw the rapid rise of the Redemption. If he could use this rising sect to his own ends, he would not only have political power, but spiritual authority as well. And I don't have to tell you, Adept, what power Faith has in the Imperium. In a bid to take control, he renamed himself the Thane of Cawdor, and declared himself the head of the Redemptionist Faith, an act that worked better than even he could have hoped, because it gave something the Redemption desperately needed. Structure. Soon people flocked to House Cawdor, and the clan's population exploded, and for a brief moment, Perhaps Aeronath had dreamed of conquering Necromunda with a tide of faithful Carterites under his beck and call. If he did, those dreams were short-lived, because if Aeronath had bothered to research the faith a bit deeper, he would have realized that the Redemptionists did not respect blood or titles. All that mattered to them was faith, and how impressive your shows of devotion to the Emperor were. Shows of devotion that I assume were seen as inadequate, as rather quickly all the matriarchs and patriarchs of the clan were replaced by those whose devotion to the Emperor was most clear. As for the fate of those former heads of House Cawdor, I'm not exactly sure what became of them, but I'm going to assume whatever that fate was, it was rather bloody. Since the embrace of the cult two millennia ago, House Cawdor has spread to every corner of Necromunda, accepting all those who would follow the true path towards the Emperor's light. Although many who enter the faith are the disenfranchised looking for hope in the depths of the Hive, Others are born into it, or taken young in an event known as the Childer Harvest, a rather ominous sounding title for the simple collection of those children orphaned at a young age, due to the violent nature of Necromundan life. Although it is seen as a holy and righteous pursuit by the members of House Cawdor, it has a less than stellar reputation amongst the people of Necromunda, as it is rumored that those performing the Childer Harvest not only take orphans, but also those children whose parents aren't exactly giving them their full attention. Whatever their origins, those who join the cult are kept in highly segregated communities, where they are taught the various rituals required for every part of their life. From the correct means of eating one's corpse starch rations, to how to get out of their hab block without sinning, as well as constantly going over the various holy works of the redemption. So ingrained are these lessons, that many within the cult speak in a form of pilgrim's cant, a mixture of low gothic, religious quotes, and ritualistic phrases that only those familiar with the faith would ever hope to decipher. All these lessons drive home the core tenets of the Redemptionist faith, the sect believing that humanity has fallen far from the ideals of the Emperor, drowning in filth and depravity while pursuing activities such as drinking, gambling, lying, profanity, lechery and honestly anything most people would consider fun. As long as humanity could not surpass their sinful nature, they would never be able to truly conquer the galaxy. And the only way to purge this sinful nature was through faith, blood, and most importantly, fire. These lessons also teach the true structure of the galaxy. At the top of course is the God Emperor, most holy of holies and below him is his corporeal representative, the Thane. Each Thane, when they rise to power, takes his seat in the Palace of Bone, the most sacred site in Negromunda, at least to the Redemption. From here, he performs his two most vital duties. The first, of course, is to spread the faith. Generations of Thanes having ensured that every corner of Necromunda, from the deepest hive to the most dangerous parts of the Wastes, having at least a few Carterites there to spread the Emperor's word. Their second duty is to write the laws that the Carterites must follow to stay in the Emperor's good graces. Laws that coincidentally reinforce the Thane's power and influence amongst his people. To enforce these laws, he has his metaphorical hands, the Word Keepers. 
gifted a sacred object, phrase, or holy writ by the Thane as a symbol of their favor. These word keepers are given full authority to enforce the Thane's will in any way they see fit. And unlike the Ministorum, where missionaries, confessors, and the like are chosen in a complex and overwrought system, word keepers are chosen by the Emperor himself. The word keeper receiving a religious vision that could only have come from his most holy. The fact that many of these chosen had suffered from a lack of oxygen in a hive accident, or consumed a particularly hallucinogenic brew, is obviously pure coincidence. And beneath the word keepers are their firebrands, favored lieutenants who help the word keepers enact their will in the same way a thug would enact the will of their crime boss. Whether true believers, or individuals who simply use their faith as an excuse to crack a few skulls, it is they who ensure the loyalty and productivity of the endless tide of midden thieves, bone pickers, and various other titles given to the rest of the people who follow the faith. Millions of wretches who live in filth and suffer brutal conditions willingly and happily, for they truly believe it is the Emperor's will. They can be found almost everywhere, for they live in a place as often overlooked or abandoned by other clan houses, due to being too inhospitable or considered of little value due to the minimal resources available there. It is there that they survive in the midden heaps they call home, whether that be in scrap heaps and broken sections of the underhive, abandoned factora long since past their usefulness, or boneyards where they settle in pits of decaying biological matter. In these places, they erect churches made of scrap and halves burrowed into the waste, and beneath them, bored into the rubbish, our vast swaths of tunnels and chambers inundated with symbols of his most holy redemption. Despite these horrible conditions that would have made even the hardiest underhive ganger bulk, the Cauterites survive and thrive, their faith allowing them a strength and a constitution that few can match. And it is in these communities where they do the work of the clan, sifting through trash to find the treasures beneath, scraps of metal, chemicals from industrial waste, exotic fungi, scavenging animals to consume or tame, all done without any of the machines you might find in use by the Duster Clans or House Orlock, and almost all in locations either group would consider it a waste to even try, because what they lack in tools, the members of House Cardor have plenty of faith and bodies to make up for it. One Carterite's contribution is small, but times that by millions, and you have the wealth necessary to remain a clan house. Beyond the filtering of filth, the members of House Carter also do odd jobs for the guilds and other clan houses, jobs those groups consider too dangerous to use their own people for. Even House Goliath will often hire them instead of using their own slaves, as the slaves are considered far more valuable. These jobs include walking around power lines to pull levers or turn cranks, crawling in cramped spaces in factoria or sewage systems to clean vital components and even wrangling dangerous creatures like wolf spiders and feral grocs to sell to interested parties across the hive. Now despite the horrible conditions they seem to live in, and the grueling work they do, these Carterites aren't slaves. They do occasionally receive payment. Scraps of script they receive as a bonus for the work they do for the Emperor. Scraps that usually aren't enough to buy anything of worth from the other clans. Not that they would if they could considering most Carterites view anyone who isn't them as heretics or heretics-to-be. Thus, their wealth tends to go back into the clan, the Carterites purchasing holy relics, scrawled prayers, and religious blessings from Cardor Scriveners. These Scriveners spend cycles pouring over objects of religious significance that they find, burnt-out power cells with divine heat, a piece of glass with a smudge that looks somewhat like the Imperial Aquila, a shell casing that had to have come from a space marine, and so on. If a relic is discovered, a word keeper is sent for to verify the Scrivener's claim. If found to have significance, the relic is allowed to be kept or sold. If the word keeper doesn't want to keep it for himself, that is. Millions of these objects can be found in circulation throughout Necromunda, and most Carterites can be found with at least one or more in their possession. Now with how vital the work of the clan house seems to be for Necromunda, and how numerous and spread out their faithful are, you would think most would hesitate to take on such a powerful force, and you would mostly be right. But a event around the 40th millennium caused a dramatic shift in the house that nearly brought about their doom. It was around that time that a subsect of the clan that had previously gone off world to spread the faith had returned, renaming itself the Red Redemption, 
the horrors of the galaxy had turned them into an even more radicalized and zealous group. They took it as their mission to focus solely on removing the mutant, the witch, and the heretic from the hives. Which is all well and good, but their definition of who was considered heretic was extremely loose, and their frequent attacks on those they considered sinners was actually interfering with Necromunda's day-to-day -day operations. By the middle of the 41st millennium, this radical sect of the Redemptionist faith was seen as a threat to the stability of the world, and in response, many of the noble and clan houses enacted crippling sanctions upon Cardor Industries. Not only that, but an alliance of nobles were close to convincing Lord Helmwar to petition the Ecclesiarchy to declare the Redemption a subversive cult and ban its practice, something the Ecclesiarchy might have actually done as they already barely tolerated the Redemptionist creed. To prevent the dissolution of their house, the Thane declared the Pax Redemptus. It promised the Imperial House that no member of the Redemption would ever bear arms in the name of the Faith. Those who fought for the House would do so as warriors of Cawdor, and any who took up arms and declared themselves as a Redemptionist would be declared outlaws. This action divided the House. Some viewed the Radicals of the Redemption as the purest expression of the Faith and longed to join them if not for obligations or fear of death. Others saw them as a threat to the stability of the clan, and the Thane needed to do more than simply brand them as outlaws. Whether right or wrong, the Pax Redemptus did save the house, and viewed outwardly, the divide was clear, although things were a bit muddled up close, as Thanes continued to secretly arm these radical redemptionists with weapons and war gear as they are so good at extending the house's influence in places such as the Underhive. In the deep and lawless depths of the Underhive, you will often find that gangs of House Cardor are doing the clan's dirty, or wholly from a redemptionist point of view, work. And these gangs come in two forms, those who fight as members of House Cardor, and those who fight for the redemption. The form of those who fight for House Cardor is essentially the same as it is in all other aspects of House Cardor life. At the head of a gang would be a word keeper, his clothing and weapons covered in holy relics, as a symbol and rallying point for those beneath him. Under his command are the firebrands, usually better armed than those they lead. They are so glad to be chosen above the rabble that they show their devotion with relics sometimes stapled to their bodies, and carry burning braziers that scorch their skin in holy pain, and it is the firebrand's duty to train the rest of the gang. Occasionally, these are those who are eager to fight for the cause, but most of the time, it's people unlucky enough to be randomly chosen by the word keeper when he's in need of bodies. Given a rusty stub gun or a sharpened piece of metal or bone, they are expected to learn on the job, with failure usually resulting in a new head cavity formed by an enemy's weapon. The other form of Cawdor gang you might encounter are those who fight as part of the redemption. They go on personal crusades that don't necessarily align with the more political and economic goals of the house, targeting mutants, witches, and heretics in the name of the God Emperor. At the head of these redemptionist gangs, you will find a Redemptor Priest, full of so much faith and fire that a few impassioned words can soak the flames of hatred within a mob, making them hungry for blood. Beneath them are the Deacons, who through devotion and deed has risen up above the common rabble, they have a taste for violence, and are usually at the forefront of any assault. And then we have the Brethren, the foot soldiers of this Redemptionist gang. Each one wears a mask, for they believe that showing individuality in front of the Emperor would make them seem too proud. I should also mention the Zealots, those so full of, well, zeal, that they would love nothing more than to expend their lives in a blaze of glory. They are armed with the most dangerous and destructive weapons available to the gang, and they charge screaming into the lines of the enemy, where they can inflict the most damage possible. Ah, Adept, it looks like the Thane has chosen your punishment, and I have to say you have gotten off pretty lightly. The whip in the headman's hand is one of the smaller ones, and I can barely see the nails dotted across it. Now, once the whipping begins, make sure to scream out about how pathetic you are. They will love that. And for the love of the Emperor, don't pass out. 
the last thing we need is for you to be forced to start all over again. I highly doubt you would survive the blood loss. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this video on House Cawdor in the world of Necromunda in the world of Warhammer 40k. If you like it, please like, subscribe, comment, press that little bell so you do whenever I post so that YouTube gobs know I exist and hopefully more people can see my content. And if you really like it and you're inclined, please consider also giving a little money to my Patreon or my coffee account. The extra money gives you a chance to work on these stories I love. Anyway, thanks for listening slash watching and uh, see you next time.